Hello. So I would like to briefly introduce complex numbers and then use complex numbers to give an application of polar coordinates. So complex numbers are one of those things that math educators really ought to know about, but it's never totally clear what class they're supposed to learn about them in. So this is as good a place as any. And we'll start from the beginning by introducing the imaginary unit I. So when we are children, first being introduced to the concept of a square root, we are told the following, that you cannot take the square root of a negative number. But now we are going to take that very firm sounding statement and we're going to query it. And we're going to see that we can take the square root of negative numbers, but we can't do it using the standard real number system that we're used to. We have to introduce this so-called imaginary unit. I say, I feel like I use the phrase so-called a lot, and it's just kind of a verbal tick that doesn't mean anything. Here, I'm using it intentionally. The imaginary unit is terribly named. This so-called imaginary unit shows up in equations for radio waves, for example, and radio waves are a perfectly real phenomenon. I mean, we understand that, you know, our radio works because radio waves are real. And then you look at the math, and the math has this allegedly imaginary number in it. And it's like, okay, well, it can't be that imaginary if it's getting used in these concrete to real world situations. So that was a bit of a tirade, but let me put on the board that I is called the imaginary unit. And then let me add sort of the disclaimer, but shows up in many real world situations. So, I mean, what we're doing here um, is we're defining a new number, basically. We say, well, any positive number squared is positive. So, the square root of negative one can't be positive. But any negative number squared is also positive. So the square root of negative one can't be negative. 
Well, zero squared is zero, so the square root of negative one can't be zero. So we need a number that isn't positive, isn't negative, isn't zero. Well, there aren't any such numbers, so we'll invent one. As I say, though, I mean, that makes it sound like this very sort of airy, fairy, Well, I've, I've probably belabored this enough. Now that we've um, defined this number i, i is the square root of negative one. Another way of saying that is that i squared equals negative one. Well, we've only defined the square root of negative one, but we can now take the square root of any negative number. And that's because the square root of a negative number can be thought of as a square root of a product that looks like this. Then the square root of a product is the product of the square roots. So the square root of negative a is i times the square root of positive a. So for example, the square root of negative nine is i times the square root of positive nine is three times i. So, where the situation we're in now is that we have a whole bunch of numbers. Some numbers we're perfectly used to, like the real number three. And then we have things like, well, like the square root of negative seven, for example, which is i times the square root of positive seven. And we say, well, this, uh, the square root of negative seven, this is maybe new to us, but we're calling it a number, right? And three is also a number. If we have two numbers, we should be able to like add them, subtract them, multiply them and divide them, right? And yes, first of all, right, well done. Um, if we take two numbers, one that looks like this, one that looks like a standard real number, and one that looks like this, one that looks like the imaginary unit times some constant, Then when we add them together, well, we have something that looks like this and something that looks like this. 
is called a complex number. So definition a complex number is we call it a number, but it's and it is a number, but it's really a sum. It's something thus, something else. So, for example, two plus nine times the imaginary unit is an example of a complex number. Three plus negative seven times the imaginary unit is another example of a complex number. It would ordinarily be written like this. We're hopefully used to the idea that adding a negative number is the same as subtraction. So let me slightly amend this statement. A complex number is a number A plus or minus a number B times the imaginary unit. And in this definition, a and B are both the kind of standard real number. You know that we've spent our life looking at up to this point. So they could be positive, they could be negative, they could be nice whole numbers, they could be fractions, they could be ugly decimals, but they are real numbers. Well, now that we have complex numbers, all of that stuff I was talking about earlier, you know, shouldn't we be able to add numbers or subtract them or multiply them or divide them? All that stuff we can do. Um, addition and subtraction are straightforward. Division is messy. And then the multiplication is sitting somewhere between them. So to add or subtract complex numbers, let me put the rule. I'll put the rule on the board for addition to start with. So we have one complex number and we have another complex number and we are adding these. So we take the numbers A and C, the numbers that aren't attached to the imaginary unit, and we add them. And then we take the numbers B and D, 
the numbers that are attached to the imaginary unit, and we add them, and they stay attached to the imaginary unit. So for example, two plus seven i plus negative five plus eight i. Well, we take the two and the negative five, and we put these together. We add them together. Um, again, we think of adding a negative probably as subtraction. So we probably write two minus five. And then the seven and the eight get added together. Negative three plus 15 times the imaginary unit I. And um, subtraction Well, it works the way you'd expect. I'm not sure if I can, uh, if it's as easy as just changing um, a plus sign to a minus. Um, I guess the main comment I want to make about subtraction is that you do want to be a little careful because the temptation might be to say, well, if we're going to turn this addition into subtraction, we should just go over here and turn this addition into subtraction. And we see that that temptation is wrong. That addition, this addition, stays addition. So for example, 3 plus 7i minus 2 plus 4i is 3 minus 2 plus, not minus, plus 7 minus 4i. Let's see. So 3 minus 2 is 1. 7 minus 4 is 3, 1 plus 3i. And that's addition, and that's multiplication. And when I say multiplication, I mean subtraction. Sorry, it's very late. Um, but we can do multiplication. Multiplying two complex numbers, however, is a bit of a hassle. Not the hugest hassle, a hassle nevertheless, though. We have to foil these. So think back to um, when you're multiplying quadratic 
things. I mean, think back to things that look like this. Um, you'd foil these. You'd multiply the first terms, the outer terms, the inner terms, and the last terms. And that's precisely what we have to do when we multiply complex numbers. So A times C is A times C. There's our first. A times di is A times d times i. There's our outer. Bi times c is B times c times i. There's our inner. Bi times di. Well, is B times D times I times I. And now, take a moment to think about this. What is I squared? Hopefully, you can. Uh, Go through your notes and find this if you don't remember off the top of your head. Um, I is the square root of negative one. So I squared is negative one. And then having thus a negative term, this will turn into subtraction. AC minus BD plus AD plus BC I. Um, that formula is not something that I would commit to memory. I would simply, if I'm faced with a complex product, I would FOIL it. I wouldn't have a formula memorized. I just redo the work on the previous frame. The first terms give us eight. The outer terms give us 12i. The inner terms, just by coincidence, also give us 12i. The last terms, give us 18 i squared. i squared is negative one. So that 18 becomes negative. Twelve i plus 12 i is 24 i. So, not the most painful thing. Um, division is worse, although I don't think there's any need for me to show you division in this class. Um, the issue comes when you're trying to take complex numbers and raise them to power. So if you have like one 
plus 2i to the fifth. Well, this is emphatically not 1 to the fifth plus 2i to the fifth. But as for what it is, well, it's 1 plus 2i times 1 plus 2i times 1 plus 2i times 1 plus 2i times 1 plus 2i. And man, that's no fun to do. Um, it would be nice if there were a way to make raising a complex number to a power easier. And as it happens, there is. But there is a catch. To do a power like this quickly and without a lot of headache, we're going to have to use polar coordinates. And you might well ask, what the heck do polar coordinates have to do with complex numbers? So the last thing I'm going to do in this video is talk about graphing complex numbers. And before I do that, let's cast our mind back to the days of our childhood, when we're first learning about numbers. We learn that numbers can be represented visually using a number line. So there's a number line, and if you have some number, say 1.2, that number can be visually represented as a point on the number line. Well, we can do this with complex numbers as well, but complex numbers are complex. They're so complex, as a matter of fact, that one number line won't do. To represent a complex number graphically, for example, 2 plus 5i, we need two number lines. So this two we'll call the real part of the complex number. And this five we'll call the imaginary part of the complex number. 
absolutely terrible naming system because five is not imaginary, but it's too late to fix it now. And the way we graphically represent a real number is we create a number line for the real part. And we find the real part. We find this two on the real part number line. And then we have a number line for the imaginary part. And we find this five on that number line. And where those numbers meet is the point two plus five i. So look at this picture for a moment. because it should be reminding you of something. The way that we graph complex numbers is exactly the same as the way we graph points. So, in terms of the standard XY rectangular system, the point two comma five is graphed by finding two on the x-axis and five on the y-axis. And there's the point two five. to graph the point two plus five i, we find the two on the real axis, and we find the five on the imaginary axis. And there's the point two plus so here's where polar coordinates come into play. Just like this point two comma five can be represented using a distance and an angle, this complex number two plus five i can be represented using a distance and an angle. So, 
so we can use polar coordinates to study complex numbers.